There you go. Four commands that Jesus tells his disciples that still apply to us today from the book of Matthew. Um, so we talked about seeking. That was seek first God's kingdom. We talked about uh, give them something to eat. That's, you know, give of yourself to people. We looked at, um, in between that, we, we looked at, um, in between the second and the third week, we looked at um, doing things with purpose, you know, having, having a vision for what you're doing. And then we looked at um, praying last week. So today we'll look at, go, at going. Um, yeah, you know, parents, parents have power over their kids. They make the decisions. You know, a toddler can't decide whether they're going to go out and party or something. Like, you know, you, you as a parent get to make that decision for them. You know, yeah, you can go ahead and party, Micah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but eventually, if you don't teach them, if you don't teach your kids how to make choices for themselves, you have to constantly try and control them. Which gets very tricky when they get into their teenage years because then it starts to be like a me versus you kind of thing. And teenagers are kind of more, it seems like they're more prone to rebellion and acts of sense of stupidity anyways. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think the very fact that you tell them not to do it, I think, makes it worse for them. You know, like uh, sometimes, uh, Teresa, for instance, when she was um, a little, a couple months ago, you know, hey, don't touch the, don't touch the stove, that's hot, you know. So she looks at me, she touches it, and she goes, <laughs> yeah, that's what I told you, <laughs> it's, it's hot, like, <laughs> I tried to tell you this, you know, and teenagers are kind of doing the same thing, you know. Hey, it's probably not a good idea to do that, oh, well, I'll show you, I'll, I'll spite my face, you know, it's, whatever. Um. But if you don't teach kids how to make choices, you have to continually try to control them, and, and you have this power struggle. So, whereas power is demanded by tyrants, authority authority is earned. Now, for instance, in the case of a parent, God places parents in power and in, in authority over their children, right? It, the power is earned. How is it earned? Well, because God put them in charge of the child. Um, so kind of roll with me on this, okay? Tacitus once said, if you don't know who Tacitus is, don't worry about it. He said, it's a long, written a long time ago, that's all you need to know. Uh, he said this, if you would know who controls you, see who you may not criticize. If you would know who, contro who controls you, see who you may not criticize. Now this says a lot about, now I don't want you to take, the, take that to politics. I'm not talking about politics. I want you to take this idea and apply it to the church. Okay, now, now, hold on, okay, hold on to your seats. How do pastors earn authority? Well, God calls someone to a church to serve, and it's up to the pastor to not be a tyrant, but to serve. You know, you see that some pastors don't do this very well. They go in, they start making demands, they start misusing funds, they start, you know, that kind of, well, that's not good. You know, that's, that's an abuse of power. Um, but the fact still remains that God appoints pastors to their position. So then, so you, you have on one side, God gives them the authority over the church, but then on the other hand, you have that they kind of have to earn their authority too. You know what I mean? I mean, take, for instance, our pastor. You know, look at all the good that he's done for the church and for the community. Even if God hadn't have put him in authority, He's still earned his authority either way. See what I mean? Do you kind of get what I'm, what I'm going on with on this? Okay, so what about me as, a, me as a parent? Who gave me authority over my kids? Well, God did when he gave them to me. I don't own them. They're God's. And God can choose to take them because they're his, his kids. But he's put me in authority over them in the meantime. Um... It's up, it's up to me to not be a tyrant as a parent. And Paul even writes about this when he says, you know, don't, don't, don't try and irritate your kids, fathers. You know, um, more could be said there, but we're staying on, tar on topic. Uh, so that brings us to a very interesting idea. So who can you not criticize? I think if we're honest, I think if we're honest, um, and kind of look at who we're criticizing, it kind of shows us who's really in control of our lives. 
You know, going back to this idea, if you would know who controls you, see who you may not criticize. Many of us criticize pastors. Um, many of us criticize God. We don't like the way he does things. Or maybe we criticize other believers or how they do their ministries. Uh, and, you know, that, that really shows where we are. When we get to be a judgmental and critical person, that really shows where we are uh, as a Christian. So I, I want to kind of bring up my idea. This, this church is God's church. Which brings us to a very interesting idea. That so much as we criticize the church, we criticize God. You find where I'm going with this? So let's go back to that quote by Tacitus once again. If you would know who controls you, see who you may not criticize. Do you criticize God by criticizing the church? See what I mean? So is God really controlling you? Or are you controlling you? When we reduce ourselves to a place of gossiping and backbiting and complaining and all that, you can't say God controls me at the same time you're cursing God's church. This is especially hard uh, when you're a pastor because you see other pastors and you think, man, I wish they wouldn't do it like that. I wish that they wouldn't lead their congregation from a place of fear. I wish they wouldn't lead their congregation from a place of hate or anger. And you start getting frustrated with the other leaders in the community. And so it starts becoming like an us versus them kind of thing. And you forget that the same as God appointed you as a pastor over this church, God appointed them as a pastor over that church. That starts getting difficult. And then you start having intercongregational issues where this congregation sees that congregation as the enemy. I'm not pointing to any church in particular, okay? I don't know if you guys are great at, uh, great at your sense of direction, but I'm not pointing at any church. I'm just saying... A church versus this church, okay? So don't go out of here and say, he was talking about so-and-so church. Um, so does God control our lives or do we? Now, I'm talking about criticism in the sense of judging, not correcting. Um, you know, uh, Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians correcting people in the church who are messing up. But we're not talking about that. I'm talking about what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, do not judge. He was talking about having a judgmental, nasty, negative attitude. That's what he's talking about. If you read the context, he makes that pretty clear, but people just like to lift that one verse out of context. But uh, that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, so the commands again, let, let's, let's kind of tie some stuff together here, okay? The first one was seek God most. So we, we can just simplify it with that. That was uh, back in Matthew chapter uh Five or six. Then the second one was give them something. That was midway in, 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 in uh, Matthew. And then the third one, watch and pray. That was when Jesus is getting ready to um, be betrayed by Judas and all that. Uh, and so that the, the fourth command that we're going to look at is go. And it comes from a passage in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18 and going through 20. And I'll read that to you right here. It says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. See, all authority has been given to me. That's what we're talking about, an issue of authority. That's everything that, ta that goes about going. Everything about going and serving people is an issue of authority. Who has authority in your life? Everybody is under authority. It doesn't matter if you're under the government's authority or your spouse's authority or your boss's authority. It doesn't matter. Everybody is under authority of some kind. So... Really, this is, this is a foundational question for why we do what we do. Whose authority are we under? See, if we are part of Christ's body, that means we're under his authority. And he says here in verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So that says a few different things. First off, that says that we are under his authority. Second off, that kind of tells us that we are being sent with his authority. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. So long as we obey. Okay. Um, so baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have a lot of important things here, and I'm going to just try to keep things simple. Um, and I'll start out with, with this very simple point. We operate under His, that's God's authority. As Christians, we are operating under his authority. It doesn't matter if you're in an official ministry position or not. It's not really relevant. Uh, we work as those under authority. That means 
we don't gossip and backbite, right? Do you know what happens in, uh, in businesses, you know, big businesses, what they do is they have what's called team building exercises. Because what happens is your team doesn't know how to work very efficiently together. Maybe there's office romances, which are very destructive for the organization, but that's kind of off topic. Uh, and so you have these, these people who are, who are interdating in the office, and you have like four different people who are all upset with this person who's dating this other person. Well, what's gonna happen with that team? Well, it, it's not gonna be very unified. So you have to take these people on these team building exercises, and you, get, you give them training, and, 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 you, and you coach them, and you try and help them get through this past. But it's not always something like inner office romance. Sometimes there's other things. Uh, maybe um, you just have one guy who comes, and he's not really on board with the organization's mission. You know, he just kind of comes, and uh, he just there, he's just there to get a paycheck. That's all. And so you, you have someone who's not really part of the team. He's not going with the team. And so you take them on these team building exercises to try and get everybody moving in the same direction. No, no company can survive when it's not working towards a goal. You know, every company needs a mission statement that they're working towards. So how does that boring stuff that I just talked about, how anything to do with, with God's body? Well, if we are working as, as those under authority, that means to be an efficient body. The cells of the body, that's us, we have to work together. You know what, hap what would happen hypothetically, this is impossible, what would happen hypothetically if you were breathing and only one, one red blood cell was transporting oxygen through your body? You would die, it wouldn't work, but if everybody is joined together, that's something else. That's something completely different. And the body of Christ, us, the Christians, we have the exact same process. See, we are all under the great shepherd. That's Jesus. That's every church, every Christian church in, in Tolero. So we're all one body. Is that going to make sense? Then there are local pastors who are like local shepherds under the great high shepherd. Okay? That would be pastors. And then there's the congregation. And we're all working towards. Now, one thing I want to kind of get across is, and I'll kind of say this again in just a second, pastors aren't super Christians. Does that kind of make sense? We're all Christians, and we're all working together. If the pastor was a super Christian, like what would happen is he'd have to spend his time in his office locked away, not talking to people, because you wouldn't want him you know, to get muddied with the day-to-day -day stuff. But that's not what happens, is it? We all work together for a common goal. You guys are, are looking at me like you're not getting what I'm saying. I used the body analogy. I thought that was very good. I used the red blood cell analogy. I thought that was pretty good. I mean, I come up with another. Give me a second. Oh, no, I can't. But surely you guys get where I'm going with this. Um, so we have to work as those under authority if we want to see anything positive happen. And also we have to honor those he has established in authority. I'm not just talking about pastors here. I'm talking about, you know, in, in Exodus, for instance, Moses is the leader of Israel, right? Well, under God, but you get what I'm saying. And he appoints heads of hundreds and heads of tens. That's what I'm talking about. The people who run the food pantry, the people who run young adults, the people who run women's Bible study, the people who run, see what I mean? All those different things going on there. What would happen if I start talking about how the youth group is insufficient, it has poor leadership, and it's not going anywhere, I have to fix it. What's going to happen with that? It'll fall apart. It's going to be destructive to the whole. We have to learn as Christians and as part of the body to honor those that God has established. And there was a word given tonight that I did not tell him what we're talking about. I think John said it about basically respecting other people who are doing their ministry and, and, and not, trying to, not trying to overtake that. Which is exactly what, I mean, guys, this is amazing. Um, so anyways, you know, there's a, kind of this attitude in our culture that, that goes something like this, question everything. And that's very, very destructive. So long as you aren't in a cult, that's anti-progress. If you want to move forward as a Christian, if you want the church to move forward, you can't be in this mindset of question everything. You can't be in this mindset of, analyze everything and criticize everything, you, you, you can't do that. 
No company can work efficiently if you have everybody vying for power, if you have everybody backbiting each other. It just doesn't work in a company. Why would it work any different in a body? Why would it work any better in the church? See what I mean? Like, it, it just doesn't work. You can look in, in 50 different areas. It just doesn't work um, on any level, really. Um, so if I question everything, everything the leaders say, I will never reach my full potential, and I'll make their job harder. It'll become a thing of challenge. We'll be butting heads. Okay, I'll run this through, through these things again in reverse order this time. First off, I make their job harder. You know, being a negative person, it doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone around you. It, it makes life less enjoyable, less fun. Life doesn't have to be boring, and, 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 and I mean, it just doesn't have to be. You can have fun in life. You really can. You, you, you can say, I have to do this or I get to do this. And it's really that perspective that changes everything in life. I mean, even the most minute, repeated processes can be fun if you have the mindset for it. You know, I, I remember, I remember um, a couple different examples, but I'll just go with the cartoon Cinderella. And she's out there, has to, she has to do everything in the house. I mean, everything. <coughs> poor, poor me. How, how, how like the, uh, the, what was that movie, movie made, 60s, uh, to have a poor me movie. Oh my goodness. Anyways. Uh, so so she, she has to do everything in the house, but if you notice, she has fun while she's doing it. When she's scrubbing the floors, what's she doing? She's singing her little song. When she's out feeding the animals, she's just playing with the animals. You can go out and feed the animals, at, you know, like a drone and not have any fun, or you can have fun doing it. So, I mean, it's the same thing, and anybody who's had livestock of any kind knows what I'm talking about. You can make it a work thing, or you can make it a fun thing. Really, it's your mindset that, that guarantees your success at what you're doing. When you as a parent learn, that's a whole other can of worms. Going forward. See, I am getting better at not going on rabbit trails. So then the other thing is you will never reach your full potential. You as a person, as a leader, as a Christian, whatever, you will never reach your full potential if you're questioning everything. Because rather than doing the work that is set before you, you will be criticizing the work set before you. Somebody will ask you for help on something, you'll come up with five ways to do it better. And then no work will get done. You want to know how to, do, how to get a promotion at your job? Keep your nose down and do the work. I mean, honestly, as a boss and as a worker, I've been in both situations there. It gets very tiresome when you've got to manage 50 different people and this one person keeps coming back to you and saying, hey, da, 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 da. it's like, okay, just fine, do whatever you want, just get it done. You know, well, what if we do it like this? Just do it! <laughs> Anyways, um, so it really keeps us from progressing forward. And it's at somewhere in this that I have oftentimes talked to Christians and they've said something like this. Well, in Acts 17, the Bereans were praised for questioning things. Okay. Well, let's kind of look at that, because there's always going to be that argumentative Christian who wants to argue about everything. I mean, you say the sky's blue, and they'll say, no, it's green, and then they'll just argue with you. I mean, fine. So let's, let's go ahead and nip this one on the butt and just go ahead and talk about the... In Acts 17, it talks about a group of people who Paul was witnessing to, called the Bereans, and before they chose to believe, they questioned what was going on. However, it does not say that they continually questioned everything for the rest of their lives. It said that they weighed the facts and they made a decision. And Paul said, that was very smart. I told you something and you looked to see if it was true. They weighed the doctrine of Jesus Christ and found it true. That's what he was praising. He wasn't saying, hey, good job being argumentative and disruptive and, and destructive. And No, actually, he says in almost every single one of his books how that's not a good thing. So I think we can know that the part about Acts 17 is not talking about that at all. So anyways, now, now that we've looked over that little piece of info gristle, we can go back to this little part here in verse 19. It says, go therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the last command in Matthew. The last thing Jesus has to say. Somebody is getting ready to leave something in your care. 
Okay, have you ever house sat for somebody? Ever notice how they'll tell you the rundown, but then there's always that one thing that like they tell you five times? And like as they're driving away, they roll down the window. And, now don't forget this. This is Jesus is rolling down the window. Hey, by the way, don't forget this. The last thing he wants people to remember and to hold on to, what is it, Jesus? We're listening, we're all ears. Go. Well, that I, I wish you wouldn't have said that, Jesus. So let's look at a few things. So leaders are part of the church. We're not any better than you. You're not any less than us. Um, and we must work together. Okay, this is all sounding good. And be loyal. So this is where things come in. Okay. I want to kind of combine some things that I said earlier. We've talked about this a little bit. Faithfulness says, I'm not going to talk about you. Loyalty says, you're not going to talk about them. Okay. So now I want to bring that in and I, I want to say we have to be loyal to each other as a church. Don't just don't talk about people in the church. Don't listen and don't let other people talk bad about them either. See what I'm getting at here? God has placed different people in different roles. There were words given about that tonight. So not everybody's the pastor, not everybody but not everybody decides the mission of the church. Not everybody has, you know, absolutely. Everybody has, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But what I am saying is we as a church have to be healthy by being loyal to one another. Building each other up, not gossiping. Rather than listening to complaints from other people. Rather than doing that, encouraging people on to further ministry. You know, Ruth Graham once wrote a book. I've never read it, but I will never forget this title so long as I live. In every heart, every, in every pew, there's a broken heart. If you just focus your ministry on encouraging people, you will be busy all day, every day. And the next time you go to choose somebody out, remember that they're probably having just as hard of a time in their life as you are in yours. If you're frustrated, chances are they're probably frustrated too. See, what we do is we think that we're somehow better or more enlightened than somebody else because we're not going through the particular challenge that they're going through at the time. So we address the issue from a place of pride, which is not good. You can address the issue without being prideful about it. Like, for instance, um, as a parent, I'm faced with this all the time. It's easy to take the prideful cop out way out, isn't it? I know everything. I've been there. You know, I, 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 you just take the prideful route. It's easy to do that as a parent. It's not very efficient. It doesn't connect you with your child. It doesn't tell them how to make their own decisions. It doesn't help them to experience life. It's not very efficient at all. But you can do that. See what I'm getting at here? So just a few more things, and, and, and we're, gonna, we're getting ready to close out here. We don't talk about each other or let others talk about each talk about people. And I'm not talking about forming a posse. And running everybody down and, you know, shooting them down or some nonsense. All I'm talking about is not being a part of gossip. Not being a part of constantly criticizing somebody else's ministry. So let's just look at a few things. And, and finally, if you don't go. And what do I mean by go? Well, I mean reaching out to people. I mean serving people. I mean sharing your faith with people. I mean inviting people to church. I mean going. Okay, if you don't go, you are living in, a, in disobedience. Because God told us to go. If we refuse to go, that means we're living in disobedience. That's a powerful statement. Why do we leave the comfort zone in order to reach out to people? Why do we do that? Because we're obeying our master. See? Jesus said that those who obey him are those who love him. So if you say you love God, you really have to obey him. I mean, that just makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, so let's look at a few things. We looked at this every single week. Every single week that we've looked at this. If you do this without the other commands, if you do this without the other commands, we looked at them every single week, so we're, we're going to do that tonight too. If you go, if you try and, and go and reach people without... Seeking God's kingdom first more than anything, 
you become a social worker. Now, not that that's bad. Social workers are needed in society, but Christians have a bit of a higher, more eternal goal. See what I mean? It's good to help people. It's great to tell them eternally. See the difference? <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not knocking social workers, but as Christians, we're called to be more than social workers. See what I mean? Uh, if, if we try and go without praying, you become directionless. You lack guidance. You lack power in your life. Because you're going, and I'm reaching all these people, but it's more you reaching them than God reaching them. You're, you're directionless. Okay, it's all about you. It's not about God. You're not in tune with God. How can it possibly be about God? How can a general lead if he doesn't know where he's leading to? How, how can a captain follow through on the general's orders if he doesn't even talk to the general? I mean, these are just, that makes sense, right? You have to pray while you go. You have to seek God's kingdom while you go. It's not enough to just go. And if you go, oh boy, if you go without giving, you lack compassion. There are plenty of people, plenty of people who go without giving of themselves. And you think, how is it possible? Surely if you sacrifice of yourself and go, surely you're giving of yourself to the utmost. You would be surprised. You would be surprised. If you had heard half the stories that I had heard, you know, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, for instance, pastors who go to a church and only are there for a paycheck. Going, but not giving. Missionaries who go all the way across the world and don't like the people that they went all the way across the world for. Going, but not giving. See, if you go, but you don't give of yourself, not just your time, and not just your money, all of yourself. There's no compassion there. It's easy to go and to walk into an orphanage and say, yep, I guess these little breasts need some help. But it's something a lot harder to care what happens. See what I mean? that's, that's one thing that separates it all. Do you actually care who you're preaching to or are you preaching at people? See the difference? Am I, am I doing this for my own name? Am I doing this just so I can get a pat on the back so that people can see how great and, and generous I am? Or am I doing this because I care? And that's the difference of going with giving and going without giving. Does that kind of make sense? So, uh, a few simple ways you can go. Good news, guys, you don't have to move. Not everybody has to go into mis mis missionary work going across the sea. You can be a missionary wherever you are. Good news, okay? Uh, find people in need all around you because they're there. If you look, you'll find them. They really aren't that hard to find. Um, and do what you can. Uh, one of the biggest excuses I hear from people is, I don't have any money. I can't possibly. Uh, you know, I've got kids. I can't possibly. I'm not saying you have to do everything. But excellence, not perfectionism. Perfectionism says I have to do everything. Excellence says I have to do what I can. Do what you can. And in that way, you'll serve God with excellence. God didn't ask you for perfection. He asked, he asked you for excellence. Do what you can with what you have. So you don't have money. So okay, guess what? Peter didn't have any money when he healed the beggar. Right? He said, this I will give you, God's kingdom. What more healing is there possibly found in salvation? He gave him what he did have. He didn't say, I'm sorry, I don't have a whole lot of money. Let me go on my television show, and I'll get all my believers to, to, to give me $100 each, and I will give them each my prayer uh, cloths, and, uh, <laughs> and then I'll go in and take that money. And I'll... No, he didn't say that. He said, this is what I do have to give you. And in the same way, God calls us to give what we do have. God will not judge you for not giving. Let me see if I'm saying this right. For not giving what you don't have to give. I think I said that right. 
If I did it, pretend like you did it and just nod your head. But, uh, but he will judge us, however, for holding back what we did have to give. And maybe all you can, maybe there's someone watching online who, all, who you're, you're sick of bed, you have no strength, you have no money, you know, whatever, you still have prayers. There's always something you can do, even if it seems like the smallest something, it's something. I, rem I remember when Jesus was watching the, te watching the temple, all these rich people are putting all kinds of money in, into, the, into the offering box. And here's this, this poor wretch of a woman that nobody wants. Get out of the way. We've got bigger things, more important things to do. And she gives, and she just throws in a couple pennies, and Jesus says, that woman gave more than all the other ones because she gave from what she didn't have, and they gave from their abundance. God asks us to give what we can, not what we can't. But we're going to go ahead and close out there. You